What's up, everybody? This is Law, and you're tuned into another episode of Redline Legends Podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Today, I have an extremely, extremely, very, very important figure that's influenced people across the world. We have a legend himself, the retired national president of the mighty Black Sabbath Motorcycle Club Nation, Black Dragon. How are you doing, sir? uh i'm excellent thank you brother good thank you so much appreciate having you man it's very good to be here uh, i just have a couple questions for you, you know uh, i've been riding for about 10 years uh-huh and that's not i mean compared to i know that there's people that's been doing it for years and i know when i first fell in love so i enjoy being able to gain knowledge learn from the people who have gone before me so i just got a couple questions for you uh first off where did the passion or where did the love for riding motorcycles come for come from for you? Well, first of all, uh, giving honor, of course, uh, to God for all things that he has done for me in this lifestyle, keeping me um, safe and uh, riding and a full patch brother of my club, the Mighty Black Sabbath Motorcycle Club Nation. I just want to let everybody know that um, I'm very thankful. Um, and then I'm very honored to be you know, found, I saw your podcast and yeah. young new guy in the group and, you know, coming out and uh, professional and everything is looking good. And you've traveled quite a distance to come see me and, and uh, also attend your, 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 your party, your, your, your annual uh, with the block burners and everything. And I watched that club, your club, I watched it grow. I saw it from its inception and its beginnings and your national president, uh, started in a garage in my neighborhood and I used to go back and hang out over there. I probably took the first pictures uh, yeah. of the half naked girls that were <laughs> over there in the, uh, in the, in that little garage place. I still have those pictures. Oh, that was fun. So, um, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that your channel does big things. And yes, I think that you, from what I've seen, you got the right kind of approach and, uh, attitude towards this. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, my passion for <coughs> for motorcycles. <coughs> uh, please forgive me. I'm trying to get over a cold. But my passion for motorcycles. Uh, my gosh, it came from. Oh my goodness! Uh, ever since I was about three or four years old. Wow. Um, living at Redstone Arsenal, which is a uh, an army base in. Uh, Oh my goodness, in Alabama. Uh, I think it's Redstone Arsenal, Alabama. And um, I, I uh, was there in the 60s, and uh, I was born in 63. So I was there in the early 60s, and you still had a whole bunch of Jim Crow and all kinds of um, strife going on for African Americans to get rights. And it was a very dangerous time uh, and my parents were always upset. People were being hung. Uh, Martin Luther King had been recently killed. It was a lot going on. And there was, for me, during all that time, uh, there was great peace and sanctuary in uh, bicycles and then later uh, in, in mini bikes and motorcycles. And everybody had them. So I think that I was hooked from a very early age wanting to be on anything with two wheels. And the thing that, that probably set the hook okay. was um, uh, there was a, uh, a white hippie uh, with this full face beard <laughs> and he was a big burly guy. And like I say, it was... Um, during a time of great racial unrest. And he rode past 
and there I was standing there and I, as the bike came I just went and he's looking at me with this evil look and he spins his motorcycle around and he comes riding back up to me and he says you got a problem boy wow. and I said and he says what you looking at then and I pointed at the motorcycle and he said you like this motorcycle boy and I shook my head yeah uh-huh and he says you want to ride this motorcycle boy and I thought my mom told me never to ride with strangers and that <laughs> thought was gone in a half a second and I was like I shook my head yeah I want to ride and he reached down and he snatched me up and he put me on the gas tank Wow. About this time, my mom sees him from the window. <laughs> and as he... And the back tires are spinning and the bike is going from side to side. And I'm yelling like, yeah. I could hear this, John. You know, like that, <laughs> that, that. And, and my mom is running after this guy and gone. He's gone. And we went riding... There was no helmets, none of that, and we must have rode for an hour wow. all over the place at what seemed like to me 100 miles an hour. So by the time we get back, the cops are there and everything. Oh, yeah. And my mother flies into this guy with the kind of the yeah. windmill just punching him. And uh, hitting him. And he never even dropped the motorcycle. He's just laughing. Is that the best you got, Mama? Just tough guy. <laughs> so tough. And uh, by this time, the police got him. And they, they yank him off the motorcycle. And someone yanks me off the motorcycle. And they got his hands behind his back. And my mom is screaming and cussing him out and calling him all these names. Yeah. And uh, the cops are calling him hippie, this, that, and the other. And he's just laughing, and uh, my mom said something to him, and he and she and and he said he loves motorcycles, and she said something like he'll never be on another one. Wow! And he said to her, "That's wrong, Mama. He's ours now." Mm. And he had that evil Satan-like grin, laugh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they took his butt away. I never saw him again. Um, I don't know oh, what happened to man. him because I was <laughs> relegated to the home yeah. where, where I immediately got <laughs> beaten. <laughs> Back then, you got beaten. I think she got me with uh, uh, some uh, uh, Hot Wheel tracks or something like that. So I got mm. towed up for riding with strangers. But uh, it it set the hook. Like Yeah, that's what it was. He said, she, he's ours now. Yeah. And uh, I surely was. Um and then everything from that day forward was, can I have a motorcycle? Can I have a motorcycle? Can I have a motorcycle? And she was just absolute adamant. No, you can't have a motorcycle until finally. She said, I can have a mini bike. And uh, it took off from there. Mini bikes, uh, enduros, uh, dirt bikes, mm -hmm. uh, anything that had. Uh, I had a three-wheeler, ATC 50 or something like that. Uh, back then, you could have three-wheelers. Now they're yeah. illegal. But I had a three-wheeler and rolled that thing over a hundred times, mini bikes, and just grew up on bikes. Yeah? Yeah. Wow, man. That's that's real. And I think I, I think I suppose at some point there the uh at some point I switched to street bikes. I switched to street bikes um when I was about maybe maybe sixteen. Um I had a silver wing, which is a Honda five hundred with a Vetter fairing. It was uh Half of a gold wing, which was a Honda 1000. Okay. So I had the Vetter fairing. And back then, Vetter made all your fairings before Honda and those guys and Harley figured out that they'd put their own fairings yeah. on. Before that, you would buy a Vetter fairing. That was a CX500 V twin. And then yeah. I got the Interceptor 500. And then I got the uh, 750. Was it a CBR 750? Uh, and then I got the. KZ1000, the KZ1300, and then I went to the Suzuki's, the GS, the GS1100, the 1100ES, yeah. um, and uh, those are just big. Well, I used to ride those motorcycles standing up on them like surfing. 
Like you just stand up, you'd put the throttle lock on and you would just surf. 90, 80, 90 miles, and just be surfing. <laughs> and uh and I would ride the wheelies and my sisters would always be on the back screaming as I'm and, and my, my baby sister tells a story that uh, you know, she grew up with her head a half an inch off the ground as she's holding on and and we were riding because my wheelies had to be twelve o'clock. None of this <laughs> seven o'clock. None of this, you know, you know, uh, eleven o'clock stuff or ten o'clock. My wheelies had to be twelve o'clock. Yeah. So this was before stoppies. Like I had never seen a stoppie until I was, geez, thirty years old. Before I had ever seen a stoppie, wow. uh, like a front wheelie. I had never seen that before. Uh, and Evil Knievel was like my favorite person in the world. And I had a little Evil Knievel, and you would wind him up and then uh, let it go and yeah and that sucker would take off and jump and all this <laughs> stuff so i was a bike rider before i was ever what i would consider a bike a biker i was i was into the life and the love of anything that operated on two wheels snowmobiles uh wave runners all that stuff, and I say wave runner. You know, you know, I'm old when I say wave runner, wave runners, because uh, that's that's not what they call them now. But we and you stood up on them and you rode yeah. behind them like a jet ski or something, or like a, a ski, and then the jet skis came and all that. So I, anything that was a two stroke or a four stroke that sounded like <laughs> that was me. Wow. So, being that you've gone through all these different bikes and. You've seen how the just different time periods have changed and transitioned. What is your favorite era, either for just being uh, uh, for biking or even being a biker? So, um, my favorite era mm -hmm. for biking as a biker, I think, is the same as with anyone who gets older: the nostalgia of when you were younger. So for me, it was the time period of the 80s, late 70s, 80s uh, to the 90s. For me, that was just the most amazing time. The bikes weren't as fast, but they were the fastest thing in the world for us. Yeah. Like the Honda Hurricane was so crazy. You could pop a wheelie <coughs> in fourth gear at 100 miles an hour. You could hit that sucker and it would come right up like, holy Lord, is there any end to this thing? And uh, that people were just getting killed on them left and right. This yeah. is back when they would put turbochargers uh, on these things, like the first Hayabusa 1300 yeah. with, with the turbocharger on it. Know. Like, <laughs> you know, and these things would do like, you could do a real 200 miles an hour for real, you know, and, uh, and, and these were like super bikes. Like, when I, I go back to when I was a kid and that motorcycle. Uh, the, this this one guy went running from the cops to our neighborhood, and I think about that 400 Honda he was on, uh, that that was chopped, and he led them for two hours. He was riding around there. They never caught him, and you know you think about that 400 Honda that was chopped, <laughs> and and how technologically lame that motorcycle was, <laughs> and how he was knocking them people out of the out of the box. Wow. And then um, you, you come back around and the motorcycles that we have today mm -hmm. kill those. Yeah, yeah. But the nostalgia of the period, like, you could actually run from the cops back then. <laughs> there was no helicopter. Right. There was no, there, that stuff didn't exist. There was no radio and, oh, we got 13 Charlie Sierra 1, we'll yeah, meet huh. you on. That, 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 you could actually outrun the cops. I created a whole system I call the rat hole system. Just for running from cops, <laughs> and uh, um, it was a predetermined uh, route, yeah. a series of routes through the city that were designed to put you in "quote unquote" a rat hole in one area, and you'd pop out the rat hole in the other. And it consisted of alleys and streets and backways and roads and off roads, and each one had a destination. You can't do that now. Now they got a satellite or whatever, or cameras all over town. So for me. The nostalgia of being a true biker uh, comes from those days. And then also, when you're talking about motorcycle clubs, which is what we talk about a lot, the uh, nostalgia of being with uh, a real live 
hardcore old school motorcycle club when you didn't have 50 in one city or 200 in one city okay. or 300 in one city to choose from. In the old days, if you weren't, uh, all the motorcycle clubs were like friends with each other. Yeah. These were like affiliated clubs. They were brother clubs. They, they were like, it was like everybody knew everything that was going on with everybody in every club. So all of this, I'm going to quit the Black Sabbath today and be a block burner tomorrow. That didn't, that didn't yeah. happen back then. You were so close and so friendly with other clubs, they would tell you something like, well, no, man, uh, right. you're right. not getting along with the Black Sabbath. Uh, you need to go on back home and work that out. Right. No, everybody wasn't like clamoring that they want to grow so bad that they're yeah. taking the same bad people and regurgitating over. You, back in that day, a person going to five clubs in <laughs> three years... <laughs> Didn't unheard happen. of didn't happen just didn't happen so for me that was a more pure time and that was the reason i kind of started my my channel was mm -hmm. to talk about those things i think young people would want to know yeah how to how this was done yeah in yesteryear and why it was so important and lasted as long as it has yeah and, and coming from my end as like one of the young young cats that came in I recognize even with myself, when you first get into it, it can kind of go to your head. It's just like, shh. and when you have those old heads and then they're trying to give you knowledge, sometimes you not might not want to hear it. But after seeing stuff and somebody might tell, tell me something, this is going to happen. Hey, you do this. This is what's going to happen. And then you see it happen. You're like, wait a minute. Some people have already done this. I need to listen to them, actually see what's going on and pay my respects. I'm not, I don't know at all. I'm not the, the baddest thing out here. How do I how do I learn how do I learn more how do I gain more knowledge to make this this journey more enjoyable and actually get some knowledge out of it so that's 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 where I kind of came up with my uh, my channel to celebrate people who've gone before me and give it back so definitely definitely looking at because you 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 do give back so much looking back at all of the accomplishments going through the different years and all the things that you've done. Did you realize or did you know how impactful that you actually would be to bikers in not even just this country, but across the world? I had no idea. Mm -hmm. um, it's not anything I planned. Um, and it is still surreal um, to walk into a place and have people say Black Dragon or, or, or We MC, you know stuff I've come up with, to have people say that, to, uh, I don't know if I will ever be ready for that. Mm -hmm. You're not ever ready for that. And then there have been some kooks too, and some crazies, and then it's been some very high highs and very low lows, and there have been people that have been angry, people that get mad at what you say, people that say, oh, you shouldn't be talking about this subject or that subject. It, I've had the gamut. But... To have people following you in Russia or or South America or Africa or yeah. Israel or the UK to to put on your show and have folks from all over the world tuning in is um, a blessing, and I don't know the full extent to what I've given back or what anything like that. I can just say. I wanted to be a help, and that's why I wrote the books, and that's why I, I did the that and the podcast and all this kind of stuff. <coughs> but I can say that I set out on a journey to add to the conversation. Okay. And <coughs> that's all it ever was. So when I started... Uh, Black Iron Motorcycle Magazine. It was because I was in my clubhouse and when I went to white motorcycle club houses, there were all these pictures of these beautiful women, white women, on motorcycles, posed on these motorcycles, and these pictures were cutouts taken out of magazines. Hmm. I go back to our clubhouse 
and they got the Miller Lite girls on the wall or the Budweiser King girl. And it's a picture that's 20 years old because Budweiser did like one black girl. And that's all you could look at for 20 years. And then there would be these Jet posters, you know, on the wall from Jet. It had nothing to do with bikers. Yeah. And I would look in magazines like um, Lowrider or something right, like that. Right. And there's all these skinny white girls that are pretty but no representation of African-American women whatsoever. Our big bone, nicely curved, nice booty sisters, you know. And I was like, why won't they put us in the magazines? And it yeah. dawned on me, this they thing. Why sh the hell should they? Right. It, they're, they're representing the greatness of their culture, the fineness of their women, the beauty, and I keep sitting around thinking about they and what the hell they should do when I'm plenty capable of doing it my damn self. Yeah. So then I said, and then there was this brother that had a motorcycle, uh, Long Riders magazine came out, which was uh, a magazine that had a lot of black folks in it, but they were really trying to toe the line and kind of be all, all encompassing. So they would have white girls and black girls and things like that. And I was saying to myself, no, there's plenty of magazines with the other side in it. We're afraid to make a black magazine. Yeah. We're afraid to make a magazine that had beautiful African-American women in it. And so I wanted that magazine. And so there was <coughs> another <coughs> brother that came out <coughs> with a magazine called Black Rider or something like that. Yeah. And it was the first magazine I ever saw, and this is in the 90s, with uh, uh, with 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 black women in it, and and all about black bikers, and then uh, the brother from uh, uh, oh my goodness Ringo from uh, uh, from uh, Flaming Knights came out with Knight Errants. Okay, was was his magazine. So the brother that was doing the black uh, biker magazine, he had a wreck, and when he had a wreck, his whole magazine went down, and so I was thinking. Well, damn, I can do Black Iron. And I did Black Iron Motorcycle Magazine. And it was probably over the top because it wasn't a whole lot about motorcycles at all. We weren't even really taking good pictures of motorcycles, but them girls had them rear ends up in the air. And it was, it was so bad when I took it to the roundup. People would open it up and shut the book because they was with their wife. They'd shut, oh, oh, no, hell no, no, bro. <laughs> you didn't come up with a porn magazine here. But I, everybody had their clothes on. I just thought it was a great magazine. Funny, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, so I started toning, toning Black Iron okay. down a little bit. Uh, and then, believe it or not, the, the, uh, the writer of the movie Biker Boys okay. uh, at that time, now that one guy had had a wreck. Uh, and his bat mag was down, and Knight Errants hadn't really gotten off the ground, and Long Riders was kind of a mixed magazine. So Reggie Rock Bythewood, who did the movie Biker Boys, found uh, a copy of Black Iron. Mm -hmm. And Black Iron, the initial Black Iron, was a complete failure because uh, I had hired these guys from the Roundup to take it to the Roundup uh, so I could sell it at the Roundup. Okay. And they had... Uh, they had uh, basically wrecked the truck or something. And so uh, I had to pick up my magazines and, and take them from there. And I couldn't, I didn't have a big truck. So I had magazines stacked on top of my car and everything uh, in boxes. And I'm driving down the highway at 40 miles an hour, the interstate. Yeah. And these are the blessings that come from God. A cop pulled up and he's driving and he looks over at me and I got all these boxes of magazines all you could do is like see out of the front window and mm -hmm. he looked over at me and said hell no and kept on driving like I'm not even gonna stop I don't even know. <laughs> and what I had to do with those magazines is from Atlanta to California was stop in motorcycle clubhouses across the country and just drop Probably. drop off a box you know and so I only made nine hundred dollars from that like thirty thousand dollar investment I made nine hundred bucks and I got to the roundup and nobody liked them because oh, they were so crazy and nobody would buy them so 
that the founder of my motorcycle club got my whole motorcycle club together and they basically went through the entire roundup, Round. <laughs> which you can't do anymore, by the way. Really? You can't sell like that. The roundup oh, doesn't let you yeah. do that. But in 2000, was I think it was 2000, they went through the whole roundup selling my book for a dollar a book. And they made $900 for me to get back home. And it was that failure that brought the movie Biker Boys. Wow. Because some kind of way, the producer, uh, the uh, the writer of that, that, that movie, Reggie Rod Bythewood, saw my magazine, and he calls me up in Atlanta, or they sent me an email or something. I think it was an email. You must be that great uh, publisher, Black Dragon, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I am? <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 I am. And 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 uh, we want you to do the movie Biker Boys. Well, So I never set out that I'm going to do the movie Biker Boys wow. or something like that. It, it, it came from working in other areas. Goodness and, gracious. And, and so I always tell the story of when you're wondering, should I do something? Caesar had this big question, should I build the Colosseums? Mm-hmm. And he was told, you know, because this is going to cost a lot of money. And if these fe- folks don't like it, they'll feed me to the lions. You know, I'm fixing to bankrupt the coffers with this. And someone told him, if you build it, Caesar, they will come. And to this day, now Caesar's been dead for yeah. 400 years, 1,000 years, something. And to this day, we still go to the they Coliseum. Still so building is important. I, I left my house one time uh, back in the time when you could just run through an airport like O.J. Simpson and get on a plane. So you're probably too young to even know what the hell I'm talking about. No, I, I <laughs> but O.J. Simpson used to run through airports. Oh. Uh, this was before TSA and all that. And I, I was, uh, my plane was going to leave and I was late. I was running, trying to get to the plane. And I, I didn't know how to get to the airport from where I lived in Encinitas. And so I just, this was before... GPS to see you guys, you young folks got all this stuff. So I jumped in the car heading downtown because I knew the airport was downtown. <laughs> I'm driving 100 miles an hour, and all of a sudden, I start seeing these signs that said airport. And so the signs took me directly to the airport, and I'm like, oh God, what am I going to do with my car? And I see this sign it says uh, 24 hour parking, one day parking, three day parking. So I Drove in, there was a sign, I parked my car, I jumped out, and I'm like, oh my God, how am I going to get to the airport? A shuttle pulls right up. <laughs> I jumped in the shuttle. I get to, the, uh, to, the, to the, the thing, and I'm running in, and I'm like, here's my bags and stuff. And back then, the bag checker thing was right at the gate that you were getting ready to get on. He runs my bag through, I run, and I jump on the plane, and I'm breathing hard, the door shuts, and I fly away. The lesson I learned. You're not going to always be 100% prepared. If you get moving in the direction you want to know, God will provide what you need. I didn't have everything all together, yeah. but I was moving in a direction to make something happen. So God was like, okay, he needs a sign. And we do that. We know a lot of people in the world don't know where the San Diego airport is, but we got signs that will take you right there if you get close to the vicinity. Yeah. The signs took me there. I get to the airport. Well, we know people don't know how to talk. God is all this stuff that's been planned out. Long before I ever decided to make a trip yeah. to get to an airport, to get on that thing. And then at that time, you could just run and go jump on the airplane, and that's how, I, that's how that worked. So I tell you, I tell all young people when you're trying to move, and especially people that tell me they're Christians, because mm-hmm. I always crack up at Christians. They're the ones that are the, like the most afraid to do anything. And the Bible says you have not because you ask not. But once you ask. That's the first thing you said when I called you. (laughs) That's the first thing I said. Because once you've asked, then you already know it's going to be answered and it's going to be delivered. And now you're supposed to move as though you already know it's coming. And so by moving towards that airport, I already knew that God was going to get me there on time. So I never meant to make motorcycle books, to make motorcycle movies, to make motorcycle channels, I meant to make a difference. And I just believed that if I stepped out to make a difference in other people's lives, this started out as me talking to my folks. I had no idea 
that motorcycle clubs work the same all over the world for the most part. I had no idea what I'm talking about as a prospect's Bible in America in the 99% on the black set meant something to somebody in Turkey trying to get in a motorcycle club. I had no idea they operated the same. I had no idea that there were motorcycle clubs like these all over the world. I had no idea. So this was not something I planned. I didn't plan to be the great gift of motorcyclism. But if that is what's happened, because I decided to drive toward that airport, wow. and God had all those signs up and ready yeah. for me, then so be it. I give all glory and honor to God. Yeah, you have, you have impacted, change. You change, impacted my life. I can tell you that. Well, I appreciate that. You know that because it makes me, or just even, just reading or or watching your channel, it makes me want. Yeah, I, I can tell you times where. Where we go through, um, I go through my own different situations on the set or just trying to be a better brother. And you can say something one day and you're like, I never thought of it that way. I never looked at it that way. Maybe I need to calm down, take a step back. It's, it's not all bad. You can get through it. You can. There's times where you don't, uh, I feel like, all right, I, 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 can't, I can't get through this. And you get on there and you say this. And I even commented one day, I was like, yeah, I needed that right then. And so it's like. You you impact you've impacted thousands millions of people and I, me personally. Well, you know, like I say, I, I'm just thankful if I could because that's what I asked that what God would allow me to do. And I tell mm -hmm. you something, <laughs> and this came from another thing, which was the loss of a woman that I loved mm -hmm. because I had been ugly, and I tried to make a deal with God. God, if you give her back, I will help the folks that I can help. And for me, I it was bikers. But the funny thing, God doesn't make deals. It's kind of funny. He goes, yeah, you're going to do that. And yeah, you <laughs> sure are going to do that. And I didn't get that person back. But what I got was an complete and entire world of folks like what I have now. And then when it was time for me to have a proper woman, I knew how to treat her right. Yeah. Yeah. So, my last question, man, this has been an honor. My last question to these young bikers, people who are even thinking about becoming a biker or joining a motorcycle club, what advice would you give them? You can't consider yourself a brother. until you know how to be a brother. You can't call me your brother mm. and covet after my beautiful woman. Right. You can't call me your brother and talk about me behind my back. I don't care what someone else has to say about me. What I care about is why they feel so comfortable coming to you yeah, with it. Yeah. You can't be a brother when you steal from the club. You can't be a brother when you take more than you give. I would tell someone who is interested in being a motorcycle club member and being a full patched brother that you need to learn how to deserve to wear a patch. You need to learn how to be someone who is worthy of wearing a patch. You need to learn how to give more than you receive. You need to learn the words we. We, 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 we. We is about us. It's about ours. Stop saying mine, my, my, and start saying we, ours, together. Together as one. We, we, we. We means yes in French. Yes, we can. Yes, we can do it. It is ours. The motorcycle club is about us, a we, a team, a brotherhood of people who treat one another like precious nuggets of treasured material, like gold or diamonds or platinum. If I treat you like platinum in every dealing, mm -hmm. 
then I treat you like my brother, regardless of whether you give it back or not. Mm. Because we don't give the motorcycle clubs for them to give back to us. If you do, you're going to be sorely disappointed. I can tell you my club has broken my heart. I can tell you my club has made me cry. I can tell you my club has never, has many times not deserved the very best that I've had to give. And I still gave it every damn time. I gave it because it was good and it was right to do. My mother used to always say, never give with the expectation of getting something back because human beings will disappoint you. They are not thankful. They only need to get, 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 receive. So if you're giving in order to have someone be thankful, have someone shower you with praise, you're going to be so sorry because yeah. that ain't happening. You give because you can. You give because it's good. You give because it's right. You give because you have it to give. When you're going to loan somebody some money, you only loan them the amount that you can lose. Yeah. So if they need 500 but you can afford to lose 100 you give them 100 And that's a gift. And if they give it back, fine. But if they don't, it doesn't matter because you gave it, you could afford to lose it, it's gone, it didn't come back, and it doesn't have to destroy our friendship. Right. We can still be brothers. Because, brother, I gave that to you. That was already yours to have. Yeah. And I think that that's the quote. That that day, that specific day, when you when you give your best, almost treat it as if it's already gone. Don't you're not giving it to expect something back. And that was it. I, I tell you, I was like, man, I never looked at it that way. And that and that gets. I mean, I did this and then yeah. they didn't. They didn't do and, you can't, and you can't. You can't. You can't do that because you'll be hurt forever. So that's what I would tell anybody. It takes a lot to be a full patch brother, but it's gonna take more than you'll ever get back unless you are satisfied with making the MC better after you've gone than it was before you got there. Black Dragon, it's been an honor. Oh, oh, before we go, definitely, do you wanna um, give out your, uh, your, your YouTube information? Oh my goodness, yes, yeah. so. <laughs> Please follow me on my channel, Black Dragon Biker TV. And on Black Dragon Biker TV, we also have Black Dragon Biker News, Biker News that you can trust because it comes from the angle of bikers. Also, I have a biker uh, news channel, Black Dragon Biker News, which you will find at bikerliberty.com, bikerliberty.com. And on there, you will see all kinds of stories and everything, especially stories that YouTube won't let us tell because YouTube is a big demonetization stuff going on. And if you're talking about the wrong things, like I showed a guy with his scalp split, yeah. his wig split, that's to make people ride with helmets, but that was demonetized. Okay. So you can go find stuff like that, intri uh, intricate stories on bikerliberty.com. My podcast is The Dragon's Lair, Motorcycle Chaos, Mondays and Fridays, and it can be found on Spreaker. Uh, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, uh, Podbeam. Um, I, I'm even on uh, what Spotify, and I'm on um, another one now. I, did I say uh, uh, iTunes? But there was another big one. I'm on all these big ones. And finally, my new channel is called Think Tactical. It started out as a biker prepper channel, and it's for my prepper folks. You want to know about guns? You want to know about self defense? You want to know about how to protect your woman? How to how to uh, 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 harden your home, uh, make yourself less susceptible to home invasions. All these things for protection for you and your family are on Think Tactical. And thinktacticaltv.com is also the website to it. And our podcast, Think Tactical, which you'll find on Spreaker.com under Think Tactical. So we have Black Dragon Biker TV, which has Black Dragon Biker News Network. We got uh, Dragon's Lair, Motorcycle Chaos, which is the podcast. We got BikerLiberty.com. We got Think Tactical, and we got ThinkTacticalTV.com, and Think Tactical the podcast. <laughs> well, it is, it. it's been a pleasure. And you, we got you growing. Yes, yes. And uh, make sure you. Uh, we want you guys to hang out with this cat. He's trying to do things the right way, so we're gonna yeah, yeah. watch him do what he's doing. He's got great equipment. You know. Yeah, I'm still trying to I'm trying to get everything fine tuned, so bear with me. I appreciate the patience. 
We're getting it right for you. The big old cannon. <laughs> well, like, you know, I'm still podcasting on a phone. I'm embarrassed. They come in here. <laughs> he's got he's got his a beautiful uh, woman here. I hope I didn't put you out. He's got a beautiful, <laughs> no, his beautiful no, woman good. here <laughs> that uh, is um, helping him and everything. You got to have a beautiful woman that's yeah. helping and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Come here. <laughs> Hurry up. Hurry up, you. So, you know, you got to have somebody that's helping you out and helping you do your thing. <laughs> Stick your head in and say hi. Hi to the peoples. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so, thank you. So, he's got it. I think he's going to do great out here. I told him when I saw his channel, I said, ooh, I yeah. might see the eclipse of my channel here. So, you guys do great. I yeah. thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Well, make sure that you all like, you share, and subscribe. Redline Legends Podcast. Till next time. Redline Legends.